Welcome to Dot Dot Dot, the continuing conversation around art, placemaking, and how to create meaningful experiences in the built environment. It's great to have you with us today. I'm your host, Martha Weidman, CEO and co-founder of Nine Dot Arts. And today we've got an episode featuring Elaine Minji Limmer. Uh, we met Elaine through a number of projects where we're doing urban planning for some large scale developments. And we're thinking about things at a multi-decade time span. Elaine is now the senior parks planner for the city of Denver. She was formerly the senior associate planner at Sasaki. And uh, she mentioned Sasaki through the episode. So just know that she's shifted her role and she's going to be doing some amazing work at the citywide scale. And during this conversation, I love the way that she's addressing some of our environmental and social resilience. She talks about thoughtful community and engaged planning and design. And then we also talk about how you can use your imagination and planning experience to think about uh, climate change and how it's going to impact our world and the places we design and develop for 50 years or more. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, Elaine is truly a thought leader in the urban planning space and uh, thrilled to share this with you today. So look forward to learning more from you, Elaine. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, so to get started, why don't we just begin with having you tell our listeners a little more about who you are, what you do, and why it matters. Sure. Um, so I'm Elaine Minji Limmer. Um, as Martha said, I work as a senior planner with Sasaki. The work that I do is sort of split between two categories. So one is for privately led, um, dense urban mixed use districts. Um, sort of land use planning. And then the other half of what I do is related to parks planning um, and things addressing climate change resilience um, in open spaces. So how how do you think uh, your work as a planner can uh, support resilience through massive uh, global warming changes or, or <laughs> climate change efforts? I mean, that's kind of a big thing to tackle. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I'm not doing it alone. So we often team with landscape architects and engineers who are doing the really complicated parts of things like modeling what will sea level rise look like in different storm conditions, projecting out to the next 20, 30, 100 years. Um, and then what I see as my role is really thinking about how do you incorporate social resilience and, and community programming into whatever needs to be done to protect that place from the climate change impacts. So for example, we just are wrapping up a project in a couple neighborhoods of Boston. So major concern is sea level rise and flooding coming from the harbor. So, you know, there's this very technical target of saying we have to create a barrier that's 16 feet tall, for example, um, in order to stop the water from entering. But I think where planners can bring a perspective is to say, okay, if you're going to build that anyways, what are ways that it can be incorporated into public space or mm -hmm. include things for shade and gathering areas so that it's actually building up sort of a public space um, amenity for the people who live there. So are we talking about uh, Boston, like the Netherlands with the big, you know, wall outside to keep it from, from flooding? <laughs> Just like a little medieval wall built. Yeah, well, I'm the imagining like the boy in the dike with his finger <laughs> in the hole so it doesn't, <laughs> so the water doesn't That's come right. in. They're going to actually bring that boy from the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> he's really good at this and he's still a boy after all of these years. He never aged. <laughs> So, yeah, the city of Boston is doing some cool things, just incorporating a lot of different types of coastal flood resilience. Um, and then Sasaki does a ton of work in other cities as well, addressing heat island effect and all these other things that get incorporated into the way we design public space. I grew up on the coast as well. I grew up on the uh, Gulf Coast of Alabama. Mm. And in my, from, you know, from my childhood to now, I've seen 
Um, so many of our homes become flooded mm -hmm. or damaged. Uh, we used to go out to one of the barrier islands and there is uh, called Dauphin Island. It's next to, it's the border of Alabama and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And all of the houses are up on stilts. And anytime there was a hurricane, we'd get a big tidal wave that would come through. And inevitably with every major hurricane, we would lose houses on the mm -hmm. island and they would just get wiped out so that all that was left were the, the pilings, oh, just wow. the stilts. And so the way to address it is that the next time that house would be rebuilt, it would go up about two feet higher. Mm. And so the stilts that held up houses went from, you know, about 12 feet to about 20 wow. uh, over, over my lifetime. Mm. So yeah, I have always thought about the, you know, that happened so fast. Mm -hmm. And I just keep thinking about how limited our imagination mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. that all we could think was that, oh, if we just go two feet higher, then that'll higher. solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Like problem mm -hmm. solved. We mm -hmm. got this. And when you were describing that story about, you know, building seawalls, like how are we thinking on a scale? Like, can we think can we actually think on a hundred year scale? Mm -hmm. How long are we trying to think about mm -hmm. uh, time scales when we're solving design problems for things like climate change? Is the target, do you have a year target that you keep in mind? Are you trying mm -hmm. to imagine what it's like in the year, you know, 3000? Are you trying to like imagine 2050? Like, what um, do you think about? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, the parameters sort of very, I mean, technically by project in terms of what are the conditions you're designing for. So for example, um, we were planning for say nine inches of sea level rise plus the expected storm conditions, which in time frame, the prediction is that that will happen in 50 years, for example. Um, and so we're saying so 2070 ish. Yeah. To, to protect up to that level. Um, but also it's, you know, assuming if nothing else changes, that's what we would see in 2070. But hopefully we're doing other <laughs> things that would, you know, change the outcomes of what we might see with climate change. Um, but what you were saying is really interesting of, I mean, another big role of planners in these types of projects, I think, is navigating the community conversations because everyone does have a personal relationship to the places where they live and mm -hmm. to have to contend with this major external change is really difficult um, mm -hmm. to say, sure, you're used to having a waterfront view, but to, to be the bearer of the news that you have to create some kind of barrier because the like waterfront that you love so much is also posing a danger <laughs> to like the future of a neighborhood is really is a really challenging conversation to navigate. Um, I think we try to figure out a way that feels, um, you know, true to the conditions that we're looking at with climate change, but also figure out a way to make it feel like a collective sort of visioning and, and a way to build sort of imaginative capacity, like you're saying, of, of what things could look like in the future. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself... Um just surprised by, you know, the, the great imagination that we can have at times, but then also sometimes like limited capacity or just this love of what we know that mm -hmm. kind of hinders us from doing something that's so um, imaginative and necessary because we want to just do what we know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think, um, I think there's several ways we see that play out. So there's I think just like a very human <laughs> reaction to be attached to something that, you know, um, but it, something that we see is especially in neighborhoods where they have seen patterns of disinvestments and sort of false promises for improvement. Yeah. Um, you know, you see, often see patterns in American cities of um, lower income or neighborhoods of color um, being promised certain things by the city, but not actually seeing those come to life. And so I think that's something we enter into as well, where there's a fear of change because there's sort of a way that trust has been broken, that the change will be good for the community that lives there today. Yeah. 
Could you tell us more about the research that you did for uh, A Voice at the Table, that research initiative about um, of the role that spaces play in promoting community building and empowerment and resilience? And that one was for uh, Black women in Massachusetts. Is that right? Yeah, um, I definitely want to give a shout out to Mel Isidore, who really led that research effort as shout part out of Mel. A, <laughs> as part of an internal sort of research grant process that we have within Sasaki, the firm. Um, and it was looking at um, we started with this idea of like, what are the social gathering spaces and really landed on trying to explore what are spaces that feel affirming for Black women identity? Hmm. Um, and yes, yeah, some really interesting findings. You know, we tried asking questions like, which of these color palettes really feel like home? Um, and actually sort of started to see a pattern of leaning towards certain color palettes. Um, we, I think one other thing that really came out of that is and and led by Mel as well is exploring the way we communicate ideas and places. So um, she's got a really great hand for creating sort of photo collages as a way to talk about place so that we're not just showing sort of sterile maps and saying like, what do you feel about this street or like this boundary in a very technical way, but um, being able to reflect a neighborhood in a way that feels a little bit more intuitive and human, I think. Please tell us more about the color palette choices. What <laughs> what colors were people drawn to? What <laughs> were there certain like ethnicities or backgrounds you said this felt like home when you saw something? Mm. There was this very sort of warm yellow color um, mm. that came forward. You know, the the purpose of the research wasn't to try to do something that's like statistically valid and like defensible sure, yeah. from that perspective per se but um more so to try to spark sort of a conversation um around like ways to approach uh like the design of a space in a way that's like affirming of individual identities and and not trying to approach things from something that feels quote unquote objective where we say we're trying to create a space that will work for everybody, but instead no. take the approach of saying, what does it look like to ask the question of how do you create a space specifically affirmative for Black female identities? I think this is um, just so wildly cool to think about the expression of identity because it's always through our own lens, mm. right? It's always through what you feel and what resonates with you, but seeing mm. where there might be themes or connection points um, to me is really fascinating work. I'm just checking out your website for Voice at the Table, and you talk about how materiality is this, also this form of storytelling and expression, and some of the theme, thematic kind of design elements that came out in the interview commentary uh, from Black women who owned spaces in Roxbury. Uh, there are things like bold colors. Uh, patterns, tapestries, uh, even murals of statements that highlight local artists. And one of the uh, podcasts that I was just interviewing with Patrick Foley of Lake Union Partners, he was talking about their project in the Central District in Seattle. And they had a community engagement outreach. They had several of these sessions that happened over the years. And there was a a muralist named Takiya Ward, who's done some incredible work in the Pacific Northwest area. And her mom uh, was from the Central District and came to a number of the community outreach sessions. And she came to Patrick at the end of one of them and said, you know what we do, what we want to see? We want to see faces on the walls, faces mm. on the walls, carved in stone. Mm, and interesting. The stone carving itself it was like a little bit of a feasibility challenge, but they did. They ended up doing uh, murals and panels, architectural panels, 
um, of faces mm. of people from the region. And actually one of the artists who was also from the area selected the images, the photographs of faces that went up on one side of the building. And one of the faces that was selected was the grandfather of the woman who runs the restaurant across mm. the street. So he's kind of looking down at her. Mm. Um, and watch or watching over her, I should say. And uh, it, it was just cool to see that come up in your research and work as well. Things that, you know, make people feel welcome or, or safe or connected. Mm. Mm. That project sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That one, um, Midtown Square, you can check it out. It's got a lot of connection with the local arts community. And one of the major uh, transformations that happened there was a condominium project. And in the base, uh, there was an art space that everyone wanted to see featuring Black arts and culture. Mm -hmm. And the space is called Art Noir. And the woman who runs it, Vivian Phillips, we were working with her to come up with a business model. And we kept getting stuck on this fact of how were we going to advance uh, this concept for longevity? Mm -hmm. Because every time you have a lease somewhere, your rent rates can go up and you're really subject to fluctuations in the market. Yeah. And we came uh, up with a concept that Art Noir could become a nonprofit and raise the funds needed to buy their space. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so we went to the developer, Lake Union Partners, and, and Patrick Foley presented this concept, and uh, they accepted the challenge. And they mm -hmm. took the building, which was supposed to be a wholly owned multifamily space with retail at the bottom and uh, turned it into a condominium mm -hmm. so that the spaces on the first level could be condoed off. And now um, Art Noir will be able to own their space in perpetuity. So we thought this is a great example of just reparative equity and creating mm -hmm. ownership, long-term wealth strategies and ownership in communities yeah, that are transitioning really cool. and changing. Yeah. I feel like what you're hitting on is like the really important difference between like representation and then actual meaningful equity and inclusion. So, you know, you see, you can see really <laughs> terrible examples of what I like to call sort of like Las Vegas representation. You know, you walk into like an exaggerated caricature of like a Chinatown or something like that, but you can feel the difference when it's a space created because those residents were actually empowered to feel a sense of ownership and create something that's a space that they want to spend time in rather than a space that's supposed to be representative um, of their identity, sort of in like a tagline way. Yeah, we we sometimes call that uh, representation without with like a, a lack of any sincerity, yeah. um, art washing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a similar concept, but finding those areas where you can have the true structural uh, opportunities for equity and inclusion mm -hmm. is it's hard to do, but you know, worth it for long term success. Right. Yeah, it's a lot harder than the art washing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyone can do that, right? <laughs> So in the early phases of, of design and planning, what does that community engagement look like? Maybe for someone who's never, you know, been through it before or is looking for ideas or inspiration. Yeah. Um, well, trying to figure out <laughs> community engagement for each sort of the nuances of each project is one of the things that I find the most challenging but rewarding about my role as a planner. Um, maybe just by way of being able to sketch out an example, I can share like the outlines of what we try to do in a park, public parks process, for example. Um, so I think that the way I like to approach it is to say, okay, what is the conversation that needs to be had with the community in a way where we can actually follow through on the thing, on the sort of implied promise um, mm. that we make by listening to them. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to walk in and say, tell us everything that you want to see, like we can make it happen. Right. Um, but I see it as trying to create a back and forth where we say, 
Um, we're here because we are looking at this particular park, uh, but we also believe that it has an impact on the overall neighborhood. And let's have a conversation sort of specifically about the things that are capturing larger picture dreams and visions, uh, but always sort of grounding it back into the project at hand. Um, I, I feel that's really important sort of acting as a consultant design team that comes into a city um, to be able to facilitate conversation and build trust in a way that's in balance with the understanding of the limitations of our role um, mm -hmm. in working on a particular project. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and thinking about what's the long, who are going to be kind of the long-term leaders, right? Because mm -hmm. as a consultant, you get to come in for a period of time and hopefully create a responsive, inclusive plan. Mm -hmm. And then, right. And then at some point you go away and then the, the place itself lives on its own. Mm -hmm. And how do you approach, you know, working with the community to empower the people there to become the leaders, mm -hmm. you know, not only maybe in the design process, but the people who lead and care for the place itself? Right. Yeah, a few things come to mind. I think one is that in the engagement process, we, one of the most effective um things that we do is connecting with existing community organizers. Um, you know, we know that there are, <laughs> we sometimes refer to them as like the grass tops. And so there's people who are already taking sort of a community leadership position, whether it's through like a literal nonprofit that serves a certain area or just people who, you know, are naturally taking the initiative to really care for their neighborhood. Um, and we try to approach things in a way where we're having conversations through them. Um, so, for example, for a project um, for an open space network in a neighborhood of Boston, actually, um, we were looking at the people who were turning out to the events that we were organizing. So big public open houses where we were asking people what they wanted to see in the parks and realizing that we really weren't hearing from uh, the Black community in Boston, for example. So we linked up with an existing organization called the America Cities Coalition um, and actually hosted a conversation where one of their leaders was facilitating the conversation. Um, and we had connected with them before to sort of define the questions. And so rather than trying to force a new relationship where we come in um, and try to create some kind of new uh, conversation, we worked through somebody who's already leading and is a trusted person within that community. Yeah. Yeah. That, that seems like a, a smart choice, right? To, and building on the, the assets that are already there, the people who already have that genuine love for a place and, and cultivating uh, the relationships that exist. All right. Well, I want to learn a little bit more about your work with the Sasaki Foundation. So that's um, a sister organization of Sasaki and you're vice chair of the board there. Uh, I'm, it looks like your focus is around environmental and social resilience. Um, and we've talked a bit about that in the podcast so far, but how are you using design as a, a change agent for some of the you know, the major challenges that confront our society. We talked about uh, climate change, but how are you using design for, you know, some of those other um, maybe um, political or socioeconomic or mm. community challenges? Mm. Something I really love about the Sasaki Foundation is that its orientation and mission is to empower other groups with design. Um, in order for them to be able to create design solutions of their own. Um, I guess rather than seeing the foundation as a way of saying, let Sasaki create answers for certain vulnerable communities, we're saying, let us hand off and figure out ways to empower voices that aren't represented in the design conversation. Mm -hmm. um, 
ultimately with the belief that we think that will lead to a better design world <laughs> yeah. um, than the one we have now. Um, so we do that, you know, in a couple of ways. The one major way we do that is gifting design grants um, to organizations um, that are pitching sort of a way of new problem solving. Um, we're right in the midst of the new cycle right now. So we just reviewed 20 really amazing applications. Um, some of the past ones we've rewarded include um, a program in Roxbury that uh, empowers young Black girls to be able to have education related to computer programming. Um, there was a group that was looking at floating wetlands in the Charles River. Um, there was a group looking at, um, it was called Please Touch the Art of sort of uh, art experiences for those with visual impairments. Oh, how um, cool. And then another way we try to sort of pass on the empowerment or the power of design is through youth education programs. So we work with middle school students and high school students to actually have sort of a curriculum where we walk through and teach them the different aspects of design. Um, and it's been, I mean, that's been going on for several years and it's pretty amazing to, to see um, sort of young students of color, especially end up choosing to go to pursue architecture school or landscape architecture or planning um, and be able to, I don't know, me personally, it gives me sort of like a longer term hope for seeing um, more diversity of voices in our industry because um, we're actually starting to address sort of the educational pipeline of, of what students are encouraged to even consider it as a career. Well, I, I kudos to you for doing the work to make that happen. And I think even just you uh, representing your work as a planner is inspiring for so many people, but particularly uh, young women um, and young women of color who can see, you know, oh, this isn't like maybe the standard older white guy who's the city planner <laughs> that I, maybe I thought, right? <laughs> so I think even your, you being you um, um, gives inspiration to others. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And it also how, uh, what a unique position to be in too, because there are probably more people out there than we realize who can think on the scale of city planning, but it is a unique quality to yeah. be able to think at a citywide scale. You know, uh, I, I've, I'm married to someone who studied planning and Ooh. landscape architecture, and I'm always impressed at the way that he can see places and see space and read maps yeah. um, and really be able to think on uh, a scale of connectivity, you know, that goes from a city to a state to a country and the connectivity of all of those places. Do you feel like that was something that was with you forever? Did you learn that? How did you develop that skill? Yeah, that's really interesting because I do see that as sort of how I ended up in planning. It almost feels <laughs> like quite natural to the way I lean um, in terms of the way I like to understand and think about things at the system scale. So um I guess just background, like I, st I studied sociology, for example, in my undergrad and really enjoyed that the way for me, it felt like it was demystifying people because um, it wasn't about individuals necessarily, but figuring out what is like the overall pattern. If you zoom out to the sociological sort of scale, um, which to me felt like, oh, OK, it's like actually describing it in a way that feels like a really satisfactory explanation of understanding the world. Um, I then went into working as a community organizer for a national anti-trafficking nonprofit um, where I was helping coordinate sort of local chapters of volunteers, figure out what they can do in terms of advocacy that was appropriate to their sort of location um, and personal context. And in that work, I frequently found myself um, feeling like we were addressing 
sort of one um, symptom of bigger vulnerabilities that existed in communities. So as I learned more about the stories of children who had been exploited, there were just so many patterns in the types of family situations or social contexts um, that they were coming from. Um, so I ended up turning to planning as what I see see as one of the most holistic ways you can understand a community um, and really find a lot of sort of joy and satisfaction and feeling like we're taking a look at things in that bigger picture sort of connectivity and system scale of things. What uh, places have you been to that bring you joy where you see a, a space that was designed or planned uh, in your mind very well? Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like I feel like if there are any other planners out there, I feel like Copenhagen is pointed to very frequently. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> but it is amazing. Preschoolers are going to daycare and they're like on a, the front of a bicycle and it's yeah. yellow. And then people are at the river and they're like, you know, hanging out, playing hacky sack and falling in love or like getting divorced. Or you don't even know, but like at life happens right. at the river walk. Right. Yeah. It was, I had an opportunity to go maybe four years ago. Um, and it felt like I was touring through a planning PowerPoint. <laughs> it's used rightfully so very frequently as like the good examples that we look to. Um, other places that come to mind, I mean, your your description just sparked a memory of being in Kyoto in Japan, um, where because of the built environment and because of the culture, it just feels like young children and like the older adults are still full participants of social life and public life there, which felt really beautiful and actually made me realize that wasn't the case in a lot of American cities, which I hadn't noticed before. Um, oh, can I share a story yeah. with you about being in, in Japan? So in Kyoto, we went when our daughter, who's now 13, when she was five months old mm. and she was born with red hair. So she looked very different, uh, which was really you know, I think exciting for some people. And the, but the thing that struck that struck us when we arrived in Japan, the customs agents called called us over, waved us over to uh, another kiosk, and I thought, oh, for sure, we were just something was going to happen, and it was going to be a really long, mm -hmm. you know, effort to. Uh, we must have been selected for a special screening, but actually, there was a very you know long a long line of hundreds of people who had come on this flight from the U S to Japan. And because we had a baby, they said, Oh, come over here. We'll help you get through more mm. quickly. And then when we would go to restaurants, we went to a restaurant in Kyoto. They said, Oh, come, come, we'll, we'll get a seat for you. And, mm. you know, there was a, a line of people waiting and it felt terrible, but there, everyone was accommodating. It was like they were accommodating for the weakest points mm. anywhere in the community. So if you were older or if you had a baby, everyone was trying to accommodate so that mm. there was this equal, uh, like equal opportunity or mm. equal appreciation for everyone to get their basic needs cared for. Yeah. And so we got to come, you know, we got to come through customs and then they said, oh, here's, you know, here's the, the nursing room on the other side. And it, it was shocking to come back to the United States. They're like, get in line. <laughs> Just like anyone else, you know, we're like, yeah. wait, we want to go back. They were like so nice to us with our baby. So if you're ever going to go to to Japan, yes, take, you know, your, uh, your beloved grandmother or grandfather, That's if you right. have one or a baby with you, the best way to travel. It's <laughs> amazing. So the a couple few a couple questions as we come to a close. What industry trends are you seeing that you think might impact what you're doing moving forward? Um, yeah, I think one major 
trend um, or sort of renewed attention is the explicit sort of articulation of the importance of equity in the work that we do as planners and designers. Um, because I tend to have this sort of optimistic and cynical self fighting each other in my head. I think the thing that I'm really eager to observe and really see as a challenge is for all of us um, in the industry to really rise to the occasion um, with humility and be able to really think through what the heck it means for the work that we do instead of rushing towards figuring out a way to communicate it in a way that feels resolved um, and figured out. Um, I think that there's groups out there doing some really incredible work, um, really empowering sort of grassroots community decision-making. Um, and it feels like there's kind of a, a fresh opportunity to, to disrupt the way things have been done. Um, so that's like one sort of, trend or, or pattern that I'm seeing um, in the design and planning field that I'm really excited um, and quite frankly, a little bit intimidated by because I, I feel a sense of responsibility to try to address that as well. Mm. Yeah, and the need to have resolution in our work is you know, so prevalent because it tells mm. us something, we accomplished something mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. all want to feel like we accomplished something. Right. So it's such a driving a driving force, but yeah. being able to sit in a space and say, it's okay if we don't know the answer mm -hmm. yet or yeah. for a long time. Ooh, the tension's so uncomfortable, Martha. We don't like it. It's so <laughs> uncomfortable. You just feel it right now, but you're making me feel safe, Elaine. So it's okay. I feel safe here in this, in this space of tension. <laughs> Could you tell us about a piece of artwork or, or a personal art experience, like a concert or a play or a piece of public art or, or architecture or a museum visit, something that made an impression on you or was especially memorable? Um, something that comes to mind as a recent experience is I visited the uh, Clifford Still Museum here in Denver. Um, oh, the Brad Clopeville architecture is, is so good. Just a really beautiful building. And we hadn't planned this, but by sheer luck, we were there on the last day of a certain exhibit. Um, and so they had invited this musical duo that was an acoustic guitar and a violin playing together. Um, mm. And just the size of the building and the way they were placed, you could hear the music through the entire space as you were walking oh. around and viewing the art. And it was really magical and um yeah it just felt super peaceful and it felt like a really good match to the fact that it is just showing one artist's work um and then it just felt like the type of museum experience that really felt like I was going deep and in, into understanding one thing rather than it being sort of like an exposure to a million different things mm. I'm so glad that you brought that space up. It is my favorite piece of museum architecture mm. in the state of Colorado. So really well done. Beautiful. And it's humble, like you were mm -hmm. saying, being humble about our work and the, you know, and humble about our approach. I think the humility of that building is so prevalent because it's really, it's there for the, to let the painting speak. Mm. So cool. Well, Elaine, it's been Amazing to have you as a guest, as always. I love hearing about your philosophies, the way you think, and the way that you're planning for the future of the places that we live, work, and play. So thanks for, for your work and for uh, thinking out till and imagining things for 2070 and what our <laughs> lives will be like then. Uh, Awesome. Well, we will include links to the Sasaki page, the Sasaki Foundation, and uh, the Voice at the Table project if you guys want to check that out and learn more about those projects. So thank you so much for joining us, Elaine. Appreciate seeing you as always. Thank you. See you soon. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Dot 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 today. And for more information about our guest and what we chatted about, check out our show notes at 9.arts.com slash podcast. 
Keep in mind that's 9.arts spelled out.com slash podcast. And to keep up with our latest episodes, be sure to subscribe to 9.arts on YouTube or subscribe to dot, 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 wherever you get your podcasts. If you're looking to transform your next project with art, please email us, let's talk at 9.arts.com. And here's to wishing you continued creativity. Until next time.